This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of the Puck Poolies Podcast. If you're listening, it probably just comes across like a regular show. Maybe our voices sound just a tiny bit muffled. That's because we're wearing masks. We are dressed up for Halloween because we love Halloween. So this is Matt Larkin, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man version with Venom, Stephen Ellis, my partner in crime. Sometimes, sometimes I'm fighting Stephen Ellis, I guess, in the comic book world. But we're here to talk fantasy hockey as always. Stephen, looking great in your mask. And how is your team doing right now? Well, both leagues, I uh, I won. the My six-team league, it was very close. I had a, about a 70-point lead heading into the... Uh, final day and that became a six point lead at the end of it that was okay i'm happy with it in my other pool the the one of the scouts did very well kind of led from the get-go looked really good i have a chance to be first place in both pools by next week okay very impressive and and i'm very pleased to say that i'm no longer in first place so my my good. rebuild is finally going in the right direction i finally lost in my head to head i'm still a little higher in the standings than i want to be which is a concern because in our rules if you make the final, you get two keepers. If you make the playoffs, you get three. If you miss the playoffs, you get four. So I want four keepers. So if I keep mm-hmm. doing too well, I'm going to only get three keepers, which would kind of be a disaster for me. So I don't want that to happen, but we'll see. It's still early, so there's still plenty of time for my team to suck. But let's, uh, Stephen, let's let's do some pickups of the week. There is going to be a caveat here. We are recording the show earlier than normal we're recording it on a monday and there are 18 games on the schedule so if you're listening to this and you mentioned a player that's injured anything like that it's only because we're recording a little bit earlier than normal hopefully everybody's going to be okay and let's talk some pickups all right let's start with a guy that i have at least in one of my pools i can't remember which one it is the shadow league pickup of the week is dylan strom Yes, Dylan Strom available in 62% of leagues. And we know he provided a nice lift in even medium leagues, maybe even some shallow leagues last year when he overtook Evgeny Kuznetsov. Of course, Nicholas Backstrom had the health problems. And he played pretty well with Ovechkin, got himself a nice new contract as a result. And now, suddenly, earlier than I would have expected in the season, we're seeing Dylan Strom back on that top line with Ovi and Tom Wilson. We're seeing him centering the top power play unit. And he's got six goals in five games, which is obviously not what you're really looking for Dylan Strom to do. It's I don't think it's going to be sustainable, but I do think the scoring in general, the points will be, the power play points, I think he might actually be their best option. It seems like Kuznetsov is a shell of himself. Obviously, Backstrom is beyond the back nine. He's on like, you know, he's on the 17th hole of his career, really. So it's entirely possible that Strom keeps this job all season long. And I think we could be looking at, you know, another 65, maybe even a 70 point season if he's starting the 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 in terms of where he is in the juncture of the season, he's getting on that top line a lot earlier than he did last year. So we could actually see a career best point total from Dylan Strom. Okay, I like that one. And he was, again, super valuable for me in fantasy. I can't, I can't remember if I picked him in both leagues, but definitely had him in one where it was like, oh, my God, his points were fantastic. Medium league pickup of the week. We are going to Montreal with Sean Monaghan. Yeah, Sean Monaghan available in 83% of leagues, which I can understand. I think there is a healthy amount of skepticism about Sean Monaghan being able to keep up his production, being able to stay healthy. Last year was sort of a comeback season for him, but he did get hurt. But early this season, he... What's interesting to me, he's playing the most minutes he's played since 2018-19, which happened to be his last healthy season. He's playing 18-39 a night, four goals, seven points already in eight games. He's playing on the top power play unit. He's technically on the third line, if you look at their depth chart on daily faceoff. But really, in terms of ice time, he's essentially a top six forward in terms of what he's getting. He's playing the right wing on the top power play unit. And it's easy to forget that Sean Monahan's still not even 30. He's only 29. Uh, yeah. So it's not inconceivable that Monaghan can actually get his body to where it needs to be to deliver a long, not a long term, but over the course of a full season, maybe some actual fantasy value at the very least. I think maybe even in a medium league, he's a good short term pickup. Okay. I am uh, again, I think Monaghan, I wrote about the Montreal Canadians and kind of some things to watch for early in this year. And I thought Monaghan being a guy that could trade it down at the deadline for a good value and just, just have him there that, 
just like it. It feels weird calling him a, like saying a veteran presence because that makes it sound a lot older than he actually is. But the guy's not mm-hmm. that old. But it was a few years ago that he was putting up those great numbers. And in Montreal, it's just a, a chance for, for anyone to really pick up an opportunity this year. So I like that one for sure. And this is a guy that we've talked about a few times um, last year, specifically when he's playing the OHL, Pavel Mintyukov in Anaheim. Yes, the highly touted defenseman available in 93% of leagues. And that is the deep league pickup. And keep an, an eye on the nine game mark. He's played eight games, but you'll be hearing this podcast on a Tuesday after he's played his ninth game. So theoretically, Mintukov could be returned to junior. I don't think that's going to happen. He's been far too good for that to happen. And there's really little left for him to do. He had, I think it was 88 points in 69 games in major junior last year. There's nothing left to do there. And from a fantasy perspective, I'm really intrigued to see what he can do. Even as a rookie, he's very well-rounded. We know the offensive numbers in junior were great. He's just now being placed on the top power play unit. But I'm really liking the combo meal appeal of Mintikov in uh, in terms of the banger category. So you have 14 hits in seven games. You ha- you have, or I'm sorry, in eight games. You have 17 blocks, 14 shots on goal. So he's really contributing in a lot of categories. And that's the thing. When a player is a rookie coming in and you because it's so subjective the way different ranks count things like hits blocks you don't really know what a player's statistical profile is going to be in terms of the banger contributions until you actually see him in action so i didn't realize that mintukov was going to be able to rack up this many hits and blocks he's so well-rounded and if you're in a, a banger league i think he's a great depth addition from watching him this year compared to some clips last year it feels like he's being a bit more aggressive this year because last year he was more of having to like he, he could kind of control the pace of play this year. It feels like he's having to do a lot more and to, to really prove himself to, to prove himself to the coaching staff. And I think he's looking great. So I like that one a lot. And I guess we'll stick with the defenseman for the WTF pickup of the week. Luke Hughes on the New Jersey Luke, devils. That's right. Luke Hughes. And, and for anybody listening, if I sound hesitant with some of my descriptions here, it's because I'm kind of legally blind with the Spider-Man mask on. <laughs> I'm trying to read my own notes, but I jacked up the font to like 24 point uh, Luke Hughes is available in 23% of leagues. And I even wrote down in my notes, uh, hello. He is the top defense prospect in the game in terms of players that are NHL affiliated. He's now on the top power play unit with his brother, Jack Hughes, making some magic. He's got six points in eight games, eight in his first 10 NHL games. And to me, it's like, what are people waiting for here? He should be owned in every single league. We know the upside is immense. He's attached to a wagon that includes Jack Hughes, scoring at an unbelievable pace. You want every piece of the New Jersey Devils you can get this season, and that includes Luke Hughes. He should be owned even in shallow leagues right now. Yep. Uh, he's not owned in my league, the, my, my six-team league at this point. So, uh, you know, <laughs> might have to make a move there. But, uh, yeah, I guess. All right. So we looked at the big moves, uh, the guys to pick up this week, but we've been doing some special segments recently. It's Halloween. So what do you want to talk about today? Yeah, we've got to talk about something scary, right, for Halloween. So... Let's relate it to hockey and discuss which players are scaring us right now in a bad way. So, okay, so we're going to go over a few different guys just with their slow starts that are genuinely frightening us. So let's let's get it started. All right. A uh, guy that, you know, nothing's going right for Calgary right now, but Nazem Kadri, what's going on here? My gosh, he's got uh, one goal in nine games, minus 11. So if your league counts plus minus, that's disastrous. And I'm a little worried with Nazem Kadri. I think he's been quite a great player for a lot of his career. He's been, I think, often underrated in fantasy because he does so many different things well. But when you're 33 years old and you play such a physical style, it can take its toll. And sometimes you see players around that age suddenly fall off a cliff. It's very common. And usually it happens in bigger guys, you know, like a David Backus or a Milan Lucic and so on. But because Kadri plays a big game, even though he's not that big of a guy, it makes sense if he might be in sudden decline. And I do worry. I'm afraid. So again, I'm going to keep with the theme here. I'm scared that he's droppable in shallow leagues. I think maybe even some medium leagues. I think if you're in a deep league, I think you have to hold on to him a little longer because the upside, I think, is still there. But the crazy thing is he only has two hits. Mm-hmm. Usually you're rostering Kadri because he can do so many different things. He's thrown two hits in nine games. That, to me, is the most actually more alarming in a way than the goal stat because it shows that he's not engaging physically as much as normal. And I'd say the only league size in which you're still paying attention to him right now should be a deep league. If he's dropped based on his past history, yes, you can scoop him and maybe he turns it around. But I think it's genuinely time to be scared. 
I'm terrible. I'm not picking anyone from Calgary right now. Like you look at even like Mackenzie Leaguer, like not having a great season. Goaltending's being around. Like this again. We we have an article from from the Daily Faceoff uh, live show, and we did a transcript of it that's up on Daily Faceoff right now, talking about how you know it might be time to reset that team. Oh my God! It's 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 well. We're gonna get to it a little bit later with uh, a question about Jonathan Rubido, but I. I'm very disappointed in what I've seen from Calgary. I thought they had big bounce back potential, and it just seems like they're continuing to be a wasteland. Yep, uh, not not a good place to be. Now, uh, let's go to Blake Wheeler, a guy that was bought out by the Winnipeg Jets. Looked like, you know what? He's still a good player. He still put up over 50 points last year. Maybe he'll go out there and play a big goal with the Rangers. Heading into the big revenge game against the Winnipeg Jets at the time of recording this, zero points in eight games. Yeah, and I didn't expect him to be making the Jets look good for buying him out, even though obviously, <laughs> yeah, he's in decline. But going into that buyout, he still was averaging 71 points per 82 games over the past three seasons. So he still was playing at a pretty high level. And he's just a ghost right now, a non-entity. No points in eight games and playing just 11 minutes, 39 seconds a night. He's being completely phased out and he's 37 years old. So when a player is disappearing to this extent at that age, you have to wonder if it's sort of approaching the glue factory moment for, for Wheeler here. And I did not expect that. Obviously, I figured the decline would continue, but it seems like it's been so steep that uh, there's reason for, for significant concern, especially with that ice time number being so low. And uh, to stick with the players that were recently bought out, Matt Duchesne in Dallas. I, I saw him playing against Toronto a couple nights ago. Thought he played a decent enough game, but this is not the guy that was really thriving in Nashville. Yeah, with Matt Duchesne, so two points in his first six games. What makes me nervous is that you could make a case, he along with Jeff Skinner, I think the most wildly inconsistent player of his generation. So I always say Matt Duchesne is like this generation's Alex Kovalev. From year to year, you never know which version of Duchesne you're getting. And if you look at his career numbers, 0. 0.76, 0. 0.76 point per game for his career. But five of those seasons, he was 0. 0.68 or lower. Five of them, he was 0. 0.84 or higher. So he really varies season to season. And Sometimes you just get bad Matt Duchesne. And I'm like, uh oh, is this a bad Matt Duchesne season? It might be. And seeing that slow start to me is concerning. The only saving grace is the sample size is pretty small. Dallas has only played six games. So if you're in a medium league and you have the luxury of, of a bench spot, I would try and hold on to him, just bench him and see if he figures it out. Um, because I do know he's getting a look higher in the lineup. So I don't think he's someone you drop, but maybe he's someone you consider trading because of that name brand, because it's, it's possible. It's just a bad Matt Duchesne year. They happen. And then next year, he's going to go out and get 80 points, and uh -huh. LSR is going to win the Stanley Cup, and it's going to make no sense what happened with Duchesne. But, you know, the Jeff Skinner comparison makes a lot of sense, unfortunately. It's just, it's almost like, like kind of like Taylor Hall now at this point too, right? Another first, another first overall pick, or it just feels like, you don't know what you're getting from him kind of year to year at this point. Yeah, it's, it's it's so true. And it just, it's tough because you feel like Matt Duchesne, like you said, next year, maybe he has another monster year, then he gets a good contract out of it. And then it seems like whenever he gets the contract, I don't know if he sits back, if it's a mental block, but it just seems to be an intangible thing in the case of Duchesne. All righty. All right, so that's enough for the scary stuff. I guess we can look at the tip of the week, which depends on how you view goaltending. Goaltending can be kind of scary, but this is kind of an important time of year for goalie battles. Yeah, so I think when it comes to goalies at this time of the season, uh, the uncertainty can be your friend because we don't know exactly how a lot of the different crease battles are going to play out, and that means there are opportunities to stash Lots of goalies that are going to become extremely valuable later in the year. So if you're in a league that has a deep bench, basically what you should be doing is treat goalies the same way you treat valuable handcuff running backs in fantasy football. So if you're uninitiated to fantasy football, running backs get hurt a lot. They get hit so much. And you always want to try and steal a few of those backup running backs because if the starter gets hurt, it's a league winning piece that you have on your team. It's very similar for goaltending. A year ago, you could have stashed Philip Gustafson for cheap. He would have been widely available. Ilya Samsonov would have been widely available. Stuart Skinner would have been widely available. So I think this season you're going to see certain scenarios that play out similarly, whether it's Pyotr Kachekov, whether it's Logan Thompson, whether it's Kier Schmidt, Joel Hofer. Those are all examples of goalies 
that if they steal the job, have significant upside. And this early in the season, you just never know. It's possible they'll be available on your waiver wire. So if you have the bench space, treat them like backup running backs and stash those guys. I'm going to make a joke here. What about in Tampa Bay when Vasilevsky comes back? Because Jonas Johansson's getting all these shutouts. I'm kidding, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> There's no one's taking that one seriously. But hey, you know what? I did, can't, like right now, he's a legitimate fantasy, like solid player. He's got two shutouts, 4 1 and 2 record, 0.925 save percentage. He's had a few games where he's faced probably way too many shots for what we expect from the Tampa Bay Lightning. But, you know, I don't think anyone saw this happen. Me neither. And I was very skeptical about, about Jonas Johansson because his track record was just so poor. And that included, you know, he played for Colorado. It wasn't like he was only on bad teams, but. He's proven me wrong so far, and I think it seems like he's going to be pretty valuable in the short term. I, I will say, though, since going, so because he's been bouncing around Colorado multiple times here, but I'm just looking at his record here. Buffalo obviously was terrible, 0-5-1. Colorado goes 5-1-1, goes to the Avalanche, goes 3-2-1, and then loses two games of the Avalanche. Last year wins both games of the Avalanche, and right now looking pretty good. It's like, you know what? Statistically, if you look at the actual stats there, not a great goalie, but he's actually getting wins. <laughs> it just yeah, it's, it's fair. Small he finds a way. He I think that's a, a fair way to put it. Very, very true. So I think in even medium-sized leagues, maybe even some shallow if you're really desperate, the volume's there for now. So yeah, he's legit. I legitimately considered picking him up this morning, and I picked Carter Hart instead. But because uh, I had Tristan Jari, and Tristan Jari, oh, I was offering him literally up for 15, like fifteenth round draft picks. I guess. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. Now, the the one kind of scary thing was it was the night that he played. I think it may even Tuesday. I can't remember. But the night that he played against Colorado and I had George F. And I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to go with George F. Well, Jari gets a shutout. And it's like, are you kidding me? So then I play him in his next game and he gets pulled on like six shots. Yeah, that's the game. It's the, this early in the season, especially when the sample sizes are small. You're going to have wild fluctuations in terms of goalies numbers, and you just have to sort of hope that the guys with the long-term track records, they eventually they iron things out. All righty. Well, I'll let you take a break for a little bit, and I'm going to start talking about a prospect that I think a lot of people need to get really excited about, and that is Jaeger Furkus from the Seattle Kraken. He's playing right now in the WHL, and I remember asking him, at his NHL draft combine and saying like, you know, you're a smaller guy. I think he was like five, nine at the time. He's five, 10 listed as five, 10 now. And I said like, like what, what can you say about teams that think you're a little too small? And he basically just paraphrasing it was kind of along the lines. Like I'm ready to prove them all wrong. And last year puts up 40 goals and 88 points this year. He's on pace for 75 goals and 136 points. We're talking about a 14 game sample size, but he's got 16 goals in those 14 games. So this is somebody with the Moose Jaw Warriors that is just impressing in a big way. And I, I you know, I just got to see him play at the Coachella. Well, I, I watched his game with the Coachella Valley uh, Firebirds in the playoffs last year, and I thought, you know, he looked like a guy that the it definitely took a bit for him to adjust to the bigger, stronger players in the AHL, but he was able to use his speed, his shot to, to make it work. Now, I think the big question right now is, will he be on the world junior team for Canada? And I did not include him there just because he's a smaller guy. Yeah, he could score a lot, but this team has a few smaller guys who could score a lot. Jordan Dumai being one of them out of the Columbus blue jackets. So when it comes to Furcus, I do think this is a, Great metal six scoring option uh, down the line for Seattle. Uh, something where you could maybe pair him with a Matty Beniers who could be that more defensively responsible player who could do all the work. And your whole focus is just getting Fergus the puck and making him put those pucks in the net and he can get that job done. So I feel like just given Seattle's future, he's a guy you're going to really want to watch. I don't know what type of NHL output we're looking at here, but he might be one of those guys at 5'10 who can really make it work. So when when the Kraken picked him at 35th overall in 2022, I thought that was a steal, and I'm sticking to that. Just everything we've seen since then, two 80-point uh, performances in the WHL, and now likely to smash that this year of Moose Jaw. You know, this, this guy might be something. And that's really relevant to me in terms of just looking at the long-term forecast of the Kraken. This is a team so far this season – all that puck luck from last year has really run out and they're desperate for finishers. And I think long-term anybody in the system, that's one of their higher end prospects with goal scoring ability is going to have a chance to climb high in the lineup pretty fast. So from a fantasy perspective, it's why it's important to take a close watch on, on Jagger Fergus. Okay. So we're going to get to our best bet segment before we do, I'm going to peel my mask off and take a sip of water. It's hard to breathe under here. <laughs> Halloween, Halloween break here. 
There's my face. I'm still alive under here. Well, I'll add to, to Furcus just kind of to keep that. There's an argument to be made. He might be the most fantasy relevant forward that team has uh, as a prospect because you, you look at Matty Beniers, and I don't think we're going to expect him to get 80 points every year. And I don't expect that to be the case for Shane Wright either. So while those guys are better two-way players that do a lot of other things, I think Furcus just being able to put pucks in the net at all levels, like, again, I'm I'm excited for him. All righty, good stuff. Okay, Stephen, it's time now for our best bet of the week segment. And I'm going to take a bit of a chance, depending on how you view it, but I think just picking any player to score two goals in a game is considered a somewhat of a long shot bet. But I'm really liking for the Halloween game, only one of two on the schedule, Austin Matthews, Tuesday night. I'm betting on him to score two goals against the LA Kings. So if you look at so far this season, six of those seven goals he scored have come at home. Of course, he got them in just two games. But there's a stark difference. He averages seven shots a game at home versus only 3.4 on the road. So he's doubling up his output in terms of scoring chances, shot output, home versus away. And yes, the the sample size for this season is still small, seven games. But even looking at his career, his home, his home splits, 0.69 goals per game, 4.07 shots per game on the road. He's 0.56 goals per game and 3.88 shots. So this isn't just a, a, a tiny little trend to start the season. Austin Matthews has always been a much better performer at home. And after that hot start, he's cooled off. He's still getting lots of chances at home. So I think he's due for one of those supernova games. So I like Austin Matthews to score two goals. And at the time of recording this, we haven't. It hasn't been confirmed that Justin Bieber is going to be there. But <laughs> Justin Bieber shows up to those Leafs and Kings games in Toronto. Just going to say, a good friend of Austin Matthews. I think that'd be a good time to, to bet on that. That's very true. That's one extra reason to do it. So excellent idea for the best bet of the week, in my opinion. And we've got a nice cluster of questions this week, Stephen. So let's turn it over to the listeners. What do we have? All right. This one comes from Sean, who says, Hi, Matt. Just wanted your opinion on stashing Pacioretty and Patrick Kane. I have them both. We have seven bench spots and zero IR spots. Ooh, that sucks. Uh, Thanks, as always. Yeah, so this is a relevant question for me, too, Sean, because I am a stasher of Max Pacioretty. I've been waiting. I know he's not skating yet. Uh, I do think if you have the room, both those players are worthy of a stash. Patches is 91 points in 92 games over his past three seasons when healthy. Kane, I think, was somewhat of a shell of himself last year, but we can blame the hip injury, which has since been repaired. So I still think there's a chance for a nice little resurgence there. I think both can help you if you have to choose between one or the other. I'm a bit more confident in Patrick Kane just because Max Pacioretty retore that Achilles. So I have to think that the re-injury risk for him is now going to be significantly high. I don't know. I don't want to say forever, but just for the foreseeable future until we can see him stay healthy for an extended period of, of time. Whereas Patrick Kane, you know, he had the broken collarbone. I think it was 2016, but he's been mostly durable for a lot of his career. So I'm, I'm a bit more confident that he can make it back and be healthy this time. So I lean toward him if you're trying to choose one or the other. And Kane, depending on the team's salary cap, has a ton of great options he can go to when he signs. Like, that's the thing. It's kind of like free reign where he if he goes to Buffalo, a team that's been rumored, like, I think that he could be a nice piece for that team and uh, they, they could probably use him at this point. And, and there's a bunch of places where he can go and be a kind of this, this impact guy. So I, I kind of agree there. Uh, next question comes from AZ Wheels. Barrett Hayden, what happened? If I'm correct, he's at zero point seven games. Yes, and my first note was nothing. And what I mean is, he is playing 20 minutes a night. He's still on the first line. He's averaging more than three shots a game. Kelleher and Schmaltz are still playing fine and putting up numbers. Nothing really makes sense in terms of this Hayton start. He's actually not playing that badly. And between him and and Clayton Keller and Nick Schmaltz, all three of them are very streaky players. So mm-hmm. I do think there's going to be an explosion coming. I actually think that makes Barrett Hayton a buy low. And while I was making notes for the show, I actually paused and then I picked up my phone and immediately made a trade offer for Barrett Hayton. I sent a <laughs> low ball offer to Michael Buble of James Van Riemsdyk for Barrett Hayton. It was Ooh. immediately rejected, but I thought, hey, Dang. maybe he's upset. He sees the zero points and I could, I could uh, get him for really cheap. So I recommend anyone trying to do the same because he's not playing that badly. The chances are still there. You have to just worry a little bit if Logan Cooley eventually overtakes him on the first line, but I don't think Logan Cooley has been good enough five on five for that to happen yet. So I'm not worried yet about Barrett Hayden. Okay. 
Uh, next one comes from Stamps Flames Fan ninety three. Is Huberto just done for? I guess that's pretty pretty stark. Scary. Oh, yeah, and obviously <laughs> we've talked about Nazem Kadri already, and this time I'm really confused because. We understood what went wrong with Huberto last year. Daryl Sutter, it wasn't a fit. Sutter played him on his wrong wing for the first 50 games. So theoretically, I was hoping for quite a bounce back in a more comfortable environment this season. But uh, the new Flames coach, Ryan Huska, he's really juggling those lines a lot. It seems like they cannot find the chemistry fit. So it still feels like such a fluid situation. I'm worried that Huberto, again, is struggling to get comfortable. And... After what happened last year, we can't just treat this as a small statistical anomaly. He almost has to earn back our trust in terms of his production. So I do think it's a little bit time to worry about him. I, I still think he can be the type of player who gives you a stat line kind of like a David Perron, like a, you know, 55, 60 points. But obviously we're hoping for a lot more at the same time. I just, I need to see him show something. So I'm not saying he's someone I'd be necessarily trying to buy low on yet. I think you need to see some signs of life. Okay, I like that one. And this last one was kind of a last minute, uh, last minute request here, but it's from someone I actually play against in my fantasy league, uh, Mariano, and he asks, "Any advice? Any advice on how to manage pickups throughout the week? Basically, kind of like we have four pickups in our league. When do you kind of start to use those? And my, my strategy is, I at least want to keep one option available for Sundays so that I could stream someone in. But what, what's your kind of thoughts on that? For sure, you definitely want to keep." Uh, at least one or two spots for later in the week. A, so you can try and, especially if it's head-to-head, so you can try and flip a match. Also, even if it's not head-to-head, in case injuries strike during the week, you don't want to burn through all your pickups early. So I think that's the strategy. You want to allot some, maybe one or two for the weekend. And I think it's okay to use one or two on a Monday, especially if you're in like a weekly transaction kind of league. Well, then you kind of have to use them all on a Monday, right? But either way, if you're planning ahead, looking at the schedule, you're going to get a chance to maybe snake people on players. They don't realize, oh, this team has f- five games this week or something like that, right? So I'm cool with being aggressive on a Monday, but just don't use all your pickups because if you're trying to flip a category or you have an injury later in the week, you need some insurance left over. Yeah, I, I went out and picked up a Thomas Hurdle and I understood, you know, okay, you know what, San Jose, no one's bothering to pick them up and whatever. And he basically did nothing for me in the pool, but I, he played a lot of games. But uh, Mariano, again, if you're listening to this, make all your moves when you're playing against me by 10 a.m. on Monday and uh, let me take control over that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that, that, that's that for the questions. All righty. Well, we're going to finish. We have to go Halloween theme for the starting lineup. And it's weird. I feel like in my mind, I feel like we've done this before, but uh, I don't think Puck Pooley's was launched yet at Halloween last year. So it's not possible that we've done it on Puck Pooley's at the very least. So I want you to name your top six Halloween candies, Stephen, for starting lineup this week. All right, so uh, I'm going to start with uh, number six being Sour Skittles. I think they're the greatest type of Skittles around, and uh, I feel like I've had a harder time finding those in stores in the last couple of years, but I can't say I've been looking a lot, but every time I look, I, I can't say I notice them. Number five, Arrow Bars, the small little ones. Uh, you know, they're good. They they talk about how bubbly they are. Um, I, I don't know what it does for the taste, but it, it tastes good enough. They're they're good in little small pieces. I'm not you'll you'll see kind of here. Chocolate bars are not really my thing. It's more sour stuff, but uh, I think that those are definitely good ones. Number four, M and M's. Although I've now found my favorite M and M's, which were definitely not Halloween candies when I was kids, and that would be fudge M and M's. Although Ooh. my last time to 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 Buffalo and last time to Michigan could not find them, so uh, please bring them back. I hope it was not a short term thing. They do have like something that tastes kind of similar it's the um oh what's it called those coffee things uh cold brew m&ms those are pretty good too if you cold those. brew did you say cold brew m&ms yeah whoa yeah they taste pretty good that. yeah they're, they're, they're more chewy inside but i like it like that it mm, tastes good that's mind blown <sighs> yeah so i guess if we're gonna go for more of like a, a m&m that's actually easy to get um i don't know caramel ones are fine uh number three being all dressed chips Great chips. Can I, are those even just Canadian? I can't remember. Are those are, are those in the K- ketchup or Canadian? I don't think yeah. all dressed are, as far as I know. Either way, all dressed chips are the best. Uh, get them while you can. Uh, number two, sour keys. I just think again, anything sour is good, but sour keys to me are just 
I don't know how to explain it. They're just my, my they're great. Uh, but number one will be Reese Cups. Uh, not not Reese's Pieces. Sorry, those aren't as good. Those are those are kind of fake news. Uh, but the Reese Cups. And have you seen those giant ones that are available at Christmas? They're like this tall. Oh yeah, yeah. They're I've, huge. I've dabbled. I've dabbled in a giant yes. one before. Those those are good. And then they have ones with like potato chips in them. I don't know why. Um, those those don't need to exist. But just just standard Reese cups are fun. I like those. So uh, those those are easy. So uh, I can't say the most exciting answers, but those are the ones I would choose. Okay, that's fair. And if if anyone is looking for context, Stephen, of course, doesn't have normal taste buds, so he needs something that pops. I assume that's why you're all sour about the keys. sour. Yeah, I, yes. I'm the other way. I go very like chocolate central. It's chocolate centric, I should say. But Reese peanut butter cups. I, I feel like they're the all time goat if, in terms of if everybody in the world had to vote. I think it would win the oh, yeah. worldwide vote of best overall candy. So I support the choice. And that's the end of this week's episode, Stephen. We kept it pretty short and sweet. We got to get ready for all the Halloween festivities, trick or treating, all that jazz. We'll be back next week and we will not be masked. We'll just be normal human beings who can see our own notes. And we'll have a good show for you. Thank you for listening. And especially thank you for watching. Happy Halloween. <laughs>